Now, for the young people who will be looking for jobs, today is the 28th of October. 29th of October. Today is the 29th of October. 30th, 31st. NAPCO has ended. Never mind that we were told of a youth bank by Mr. Ken Ofuriata in Parliament. A youth bank. And that was going to help entrepreneurs. Now that he has told us that the payroll is choked, we're hoping that the youth bank will be up and running so that all the young people who have been disqualified, or at least a large chunk of the young people who have been disqualified from the security services, uh, what do you call it, recruitment process, for all manner of reasons, may turn their attention there because a finance minister has advised young people to take on entrepreneurship and to take their destinies into their hands and be their own bosses. So where is the youth bank? That's the first question we're asking. Number two, why do we continue to take 100 Ghana CDs each from every individual who desires to serve his country, either in the police service, in the military, fire service, prison service, immigration, and whatnot? Why do we continue to take 100 Ghana CDs? Now, just imagine that we have maybe 100,000 young people. You do the math. Let's do the math. 100 Ghana CDs times 100,000 people. Do the mathematics. Calculate how much money has been got. How much money we've been able to rake in. And tell me what those monies have been used for. Because I maintain that the security agencies, because we do know that they are not profit-making ventures, we as a country resource them. Recently you saw how we gave the military some jeeps and we are building accommodation for them and all of that. You have seen in the past how we are giving vehicles to the police and all of that. So now the question is, are they now becoming profit-making ventures? Or what? Because if you are charging 100 Ghana cities from 100,000 people, assumption, 100,000 cities from 100,000 people, do the mathematics. And you say you are using the money for administrative purposes. Which administrative purposes? Because the people bought the forms. And it is not as if you sell them three square meals. It is not as if they are chairs or canopies. We see them on the TV screens running helter-skelter for whatever reason. 100 Ghana cities. Now, as if that's not enough, when we take 100 Ghana cities from them, then we put them through all manner of needless stress. Needless stress. That's what we put the young people through. Needless stress. I understand that. I mean, to join the security service, you must have some level of endurance. You must be tough and all of that. Those are things that are normal to those who are brothers and sisters who have decided to wear uniforms. But for some of, some of it, like we saw when our team went to the fire service, they had to take my cameraman and my, and my producer and, and director sometimes, uh, Daniel Doklu, to tell one of the officers who was just screaming at will at them that he's not here to look for a job. And that he already has a job. He has come there to support the team to capture what was going on for public uh, education. It was just screaming at will at him. Screaming anyhow. Why do we also bring people to uh, such places and then we taste them? That's the allegation they are making. We taste them. We hit them with pay sticks or batons. Why do we do that? After taking the 100 Ghana cities. Why can we not have a system, for example, where in a country where we, we talk about digitization, oh, we have digitized this and digitized that and digitized this and digitized that. Why can we not have a situation where people who have applied through an online portal are properly segmented so that they don't all go and mass up like that, even in COVID-19? Why can we not have a system like that? Why can we not have a system where we know that, okay, today, uh, one... Uh, two, three, four, five, up to 50 are the ones who are turning up today. Or like they do within the regimental space, one, two, one, two, one, two. So we can have all ones come on one day and all twos come on another day, all threes comes on another day. Why can we not do that? 
How difficult is that one? We must begin to change our processes. Because for me, honestly, after we had heard the promise that recruitment into these things, the forms for recruitment into these security services will be free, one would have thought that it would have changed. But it looks like an extortion. Pure extortion. That's what it looks like. Now let's come to the question of height. Let me show that photo I showed you from the, uh, for, from the West. I showed Danny photos from the West. A question of height. A question of height. We'll come to that question. So this is it. This is a police officer. This is a policeman, two police people. They are partners. Good cop, bad cop, like they like to call it. The, the slang they use for it. They are partners. Hmm? They have everything. They have body cam, they have everything. But look at their heights. That's their height. Now, we have gotten to a point where security has gone beyond muscles. Professor Vladimir Chidansu has told us so many times. He teaches at the Ghana Forces Commander Staff College. He's the dean. He has told us security has moved beyond height. And you see, when at these recruitment uh, activities, you are disqualified flatly and you are told that, oh, your height does not uh, match the requirements that are being sought. And then you, you walk in town and you see people in uniforms and they don't even match the height. You look at them and say, but this person is too short. How did this person get in? I'm sure you have seen one or two of them. This person is too short. If I was disqualified for not meeting the height requirements or not having the requisite height, how come that this person is wearing a uniform and is shorter than me or almost my height or just a little taller than me? I'm sure that question has hit you when sometimes you have seen people in uniforms. I know that there are different uh, height uh, uh, requirements for, for men and women. I think 5'7 for men and 5'5 five five for women or 5'8 or so. But the key concern is that if you disqualify people on height or based on height, let the principle be one. Let them not go back and be walking in town and see people who have the same height as they do, but they were rejected and those people got through. Whether well, did they go through politically or did they go through via, via protocol? So that even at the personal parade, you will not see them as part of the personal parade, but you, get, you again come to see them and wearing uniform and working with you, and of course you work in a regimental space, you can't question them. I have, I have come to the understanding that, oh, sometimes the height is very necessary because we are looking at a situation where uh, your, your posture commands some bit of, of confidence and all of that. That's fine. But I'm saying that security has moved beyond uh, 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 mass. And, and of, of, of muscles and bones. It's not gotten up here. And it is, I, sorry to say, but I, I dare say that most of these people you see brandishing their uh, walkie-talkies around and their guns around and telling people they are this, they are that, they are, they, I work at national security, I do this. Most of them, if you test their intelligence, you'll find how low it is. Because sometimes, in, even in a situation where tact and diplomacy and negotiation could happen, you find brazen, brazen attitude. Railroading everything. Now, take a look at this lady who was disqualified because she had stretch marks. Take a look at it. Then I went for the selection, but the woman said, I'm having stretch marks on my body. How, how do you feel being disqualified? I feel sad. Are you, are you going to try it again next year? Mm. So far as that stretch marks is in me, it's only that one that I'm having problems with. She has stretch marks. She was born with it. She didn't inherit it. She didn't go to get a tattoo to get the stretch marks. She was born with the stretch marks. Now, understanding that I've gotten from certain quarters, reliable sources tell me that, oh, because the training is rigorous, if you have a stretch mark, 10% uh, casualty is allowed. But if you have a stretch mark and perhaps you get hit, it might be difficult to, to treat you and all of that. You can count it as a fair excuse. 
but to flatly tell somebody who is qualified in terms of academics, who has met the height requirement, who has good eyesight, who doesn't have tattoos, to say that, oh, you have stretch marks, so because of that you have been disqualified, I find it a bit problematic. We travel out, we see them, even here in this country, when people have been disqualified for having stretch marks. We have seen people wear uniforms with stretch marks. We, we, we sit in Trotro with them. We eat at the chop bars with them. We know them. They tell you height is not, you are not uh, meeting the height requirement. Then you walk in town, you see somebody in uniform and, and it doesn't meet the height requirement. They tell you, oh, K legs are not allowed because the, the friction that could hit both, both legs when you're doing rigorous training uh, will not allow for it. And that if you stay out of training for more than 21 days, automatically you, lo you lose your slot at the training school and all of that. That's a fair point also to make. But I'm saying that we again walk in town and we see people with K legs in uniforms. So where is the principle? That single principle, where is it? Where is the principle? The principle that people are looking for jobs. People are, are coming up to serve their country. That's the first. The commitment is to serve your, if you give yourself to serve your country. Is to give yourself up to serve your country. There's also the angle of people getting in there because they can't find jobs. And so they are hooked on to that. They want to get in there by hook or crook. And so some will pay money, 5000 10000 15000 Those allegations have been made. They have not been denied. But I'm saying to you that we need to be fair to the youth of this country and stop some of these flimsy excuses that we make in order to push people out. Because at the end of the day, we still see some of those things that you say you abhor and that are not acceptable. We see those people wearing uniforms. Why? Haven't we seen uh, people wearing uh, thick beard? We say this uh, medically. So haven't you seen people wearing thick beards and wearing all manner of uniforms and brandishing all manner of guns around? Haven't we seen them? Let's be fair to the young people. Napco ends in two days. Where do they go? National service personnel are done with their service. Where do they go? The youth bank. Where is it? The insurance for the unemployed that was promised in parliament. Where is it? So the young people of this country are looking for survival. We're telling them to be entrepreneurs. And we're telling those who are willing to serve that not all of them can get in. That's a fair point. But if you hear some of the excuses that are being given, you will shudder. And why do we take 100 Ghana CDs each from them? Can we not have a system where they can go through the first phase and that if they qualify, then we can start talking about money, you must pay to serve your country. So that when you get there, you are going to look for that money back. You will recoup, you see how we will recoup that money. Can you get the most, the best commitment and patriotism from them? Let's think about these things again. It's not fair. Good morning.